On One Plus One, how to make peace with the earth. Sydney's Peace Prize winner on championing the cause of poor women. The diminishing gap between science fiction and warfare. And Posey Graham Evans from the screen to the printed page. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. Welcome to the program. Dr. Vandana Shiva is a physicist, philosopher and environmental activist and winner of this year's Sydney Peace Prize. She works in her native India to empower women and promote sustainability. In short, her life is about changing agriculture and food production across the globe. Dr. Vandana Shiva, thanks so much for joining us on One Plus One and welcome to Australia. My pleasure. You're against GMO foods, but aren't they, as some scientists say, the only way to feed the burgeoning population given the lack of resources that we're experiencing? Well, any scientist who says we need GMOs to feed the world is telling a lie. He's not worth being called a scientist. Because the tools of genetic engineering are really only two. You add genes through shooting through a gene gun or infecting the cells with the plant cancer. And there are only two, two traits that have been commercialized in 20 years. One is herbicide resistant crops, which are actually creating super weeds. And the second is the pest resistant Bt crops, which are creating super pests. This technology is too crude. It can only deal with one gene trait and one gene expression. And the only way to increase yield is really through the very tedious work of traditional breeding. Genetic engineering is not a breeding technology. It's a shooting technology and shooting in the dark at that. So your view is that genetically modified crops are benefiting basically the people who engineer them? That's very, very true. In fact, my very involvement in looking at what is happening to genetic engineering and biotechnology was because we happened to be invited to a conference on biotechnology in 1987, where the industry laid out why it needed to do genetic engineering, which was to control, through patenting, life on Earth. Now, the industry that controls genetic engineering is the same industry that controls the chemical industry, both for pharmaceuticals as well as for agrochemicals. And they put out genetic engineering to sell more chemicals. Monsanto sells more Roundup through Roundup resistant crops. Pesticide industry sell more pesticides. Apart from the pesticides though, for example, Australian researchers are looking at a variety of wheat that might be better for diabetics. What's so wrong about that? Well, well they, they should just take wheat, wheat strains from India, which have a very, very low gluten and low elasticity because that's what key causing on the one hand gluten allergies and on the other hand, high rates of diabetes. I think we need to turn to what I call forgotten foods. The f amazing diversity, the amazing diversity of plants that the aboriginals ate in this continent, the amazing diversity of crops that we've eaten. These have all been forgotten. When they tried to bring the so-called golden rice to solve the problem of blindness and vitamin A deficiency, they talked about 34 micrograms of vitamin A being put into rice through genetic engineering. We have a red rice that has much more than that, but more important, we have the wonderful coriander, the curry leaves that give us 1,200, 1,400 micrograms. So after genetic engineering, after 80 patents on one sad golden rice, all you have is 70 times less vitamin A. That's not a very smart way to deal with food and nutrition. In China, many of the farmers, when they see new things that are being sold to them, jump at it because it's seen as being new and technologically advanced. Are Indian farmers in any way similar to that? Well, Indian farmers are, of course, seduced very cleverly, for example, to buy BT cotton seeds. I have seen ads talking about how the divinities from Indian mythology are bringing these seeds. And a farmer who goes to watch the Ramayana and then he sees this ad will really believe that the gods have brought the new varieties and he'll go in for it. Or ads that say you're going to get 1,500 kilograms per acre when you get a 
300, 400 kilograms per acre. So it's not the newness as much as the false promises. Why is seed diversity, in your opinion, so important? Well, seed diversity is important first and foremost because I really do believe that every variety of life form on this planet has its place to evolve. Nothing is waste in the web of life. This beautiful web of life is held in place very often by the most insignificant microorganism that we don't even know about. Secondly, the diversity of seeds is vital for food security because the more intensive your biodiversity, in fact, per acre production is more. We've been fed the illusion of the monoculture of the mind, that the more diversity you destroy, the more food you have. And any child would recognize that the more plants you grow on an acre, the more food those plants are going to give you. And the more diverse they are, the more diverse the nutrients, and therefore the more balanced your diet. But with climate change, there is another reason why we need a diversity of seeds. Monocultures are highly vulnerable to variable climate. Australia, I think, should have experienced it. When all you're growing is intensively irrigated cotton and your water is, isn't coming down the river, you're not going to have irrigation, you're going to have total crop failure. But if you have a diversity of crops, then something or the other will either survive the flood or the drought and all the variation in climate we're going to see with climate change. Do you think the authorities in this country have got that message? Well, the mayor seemed to have got the message when she um, thanked me yesterday for my Sydney Peace Prize lecture. She's an urban mayor. I don't know that she would have a range of, of ideas on that. But do you think that the federal authorities would have that message? Well, if they don't have that mass message, Australia is going to see two serious problems. One is failure to adapt. And the only adaption we can have is diversity, and therefore diversity of seed. But the second will be increasing conflicts for shrinking resources. And you already see that in the Murray-Darling Basin, where if you're stuck with a resource wasteful, polluting, energy-intensive agriculture, it looks like, oh my God, without intensive irrigation, you can't farm. But humanity has farmed with very little water. We have rain-fed farming on 70% of India. But there, there's a fear, though, isn't there, of, of a change in the way that people normally operate? Well, people were made to change dramatically when chemical industrial agriculture was introduced. For, for now, we're talking about people who will lose livelihoods that they've had perhaps for a generation or two. I don't think people have to lose livelihoods. I don't think farmers have to lose livelihoods if they make the transition. But of course, government policy must support it. Governments tax labor. They don't tax carbon, which encourages fossil fuel use and encourages replacing human beings with giant machinery and intensification of energy input. Those costs are extremely unnatural costs because it's a hidden subsidy that's not counted. The subsidies for chemicals, for example, in India, 1.3 trillion rupees of subsidies for chemical fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers alone. This is bigger than our defense budget. Now, that kind of waste, I think, must stop in India and Australia. I don't think we should be subsidizing chemicals. We should not be rewarding water waste and intensive irrigation. We should not be encouraging crops in dry areas that need a lot of water. We should be encouraging drought-resilient crops. And there is no dearth of those crops. Dr. Vandana Shiva, thank you so much for talking to us on One Plus One. Remote controlled drones were once the stuff of science fiction, but are now part of an intense ethical debate. Peter W. Singer has been hailed as part of the new guard of thinkers on technology and warfare, and his views are redefining the way we think about war. He's the director of the Defence Initiative at the Brookings Institution, and his recent book, Wired for War, became an instant bestseller. Dr. Singer was invited to Australia by the Strategic Policy Institute at the ANU, and he's speaking with Virginia Hausiger. Really what we're um, talking about here is that every so often in history there's technologies that come along that change the rules of the game. These are things like the printing press, gunpowder, uh, the airplane, the computer, the atomic bomb, and the emergence of robotics is like that right now. Um, the rise of technology like the Predator drone, uh, which is a 
plane that doesn't have a pilot inside of it that is able to fly 7,000 miles away from where the human in control of it is to technology like the PackBot, which is a tiny robot that's been used to defuse bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's not just that this technology is coming now, that you literally have both geographically and chronologically moved the human role in war, but the scale of the numbers that we're using. The U.S. invaded Iraq with a handful of these systems in the air and zero on the ground, and now we have over 7,000 of them in the air and over 12,000 on the ground, and it's a global technology. When you say it's a global technology, though, not everyone's using it. When you say we, you're referring to U.S.-led coalition Well, actually not. There are 44 other nations besides the United States that are building, buying, and using military robots right now. Some of those nations are what we would consider allies, part of the coalition, uh, United Kingdom and Australia. Other would be nations like China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan. So this is a technology like the airplane, like the computer, that's spreading. There's no one nation that has a stranglehold on it. So if it's if that accessible, um, the so-called enemy can be building these uh, just as quickly and using them just as efficiently. And we're starting to see the emergence of that. For example, the war between Israel and Hezbollah was a war between a state and a non-state actor that some people consider to be a terrorist group. But in either case, they fought a war about two years ago, and both sides flew unmanned aerial systems against each other. So what's the major difference that this is, is bringing to the scene now? If, if we've got unmanned uh, craft and robot, robots or warbots being used, is it about detaching the, the human element? Well, it's actually not about detaching the human element. It's about changing those human decisions and actually leading to incredible human-centric dilemmas that we have to figure out. And when I say human-centric, I'm really talking about things that used to be the stuff of science fiction that we now have to figure out in our politics, in our laws, in our ethics. And so that covers everything from how our military is designed to operate these systems. Um, When you talk with the a colonel in charge of a predator squadron, he'll say something very simple but something very powerful, that commanding a unit that flies predator drones is different than commanding a unit that flew manned aircraft. Well, why, why is that, though? Well, for the, what he was citing was that actually the combat stress and fatigue that his forces had fighting a war 7,000 miles away was, oddly enough, greater than it was for when he commanded a unit in Afghanistan. The stress was different. Um, the uh, ability to 